This is Eitan Weinstein. And I'm Naor Menninger. And you're listening to Two Nice Jewish Boys. Today, there's hardly a subject that isn't considered controversial. But long, long ago, in a galaxy far, far away, the most controversial topic was a little thing known as climate change. Actually, then they called it global warming. Point is, the question of how we as humans are affecting the climate of our planet and what we should do about it and when is a hot topic. So hot that representatives of 197 parties attended the UN's COP26 last year and drafted the Glasgow Climate Pact. It's a topic so scorching hot that many politicians suggest aiming for net zero emissions in record times. So hot a topic that we just had to have a climate expert of our own on the show to discuss all of this. Professor Yonatan Duby is a professor in the Department of Chemistry at the Ben Gurion University in the Negev. His fields of research are energy transport in nanoscale junctions, energy transport in photosynthetic complexes, and heat flow in complex low-dimensional systems. If any of that means anything to you, you're probably listening to the wrong podcast. Professor Duby will hopefully break down climate change in terms two nice Jewish boys can understand. We are thrilled and honored to be joined on the show today by Professor Jonathan Duby. Thank you so much Hello. for joining us. Hi, hi. Thank you for having me. Before we get to all that, we want you guys to ask yourself a little question. All right? Think about the last two years and what have you done? You know, other than conference calling with your Uncle Jeff, what have you really done to change your life? Well, if you're listening to this podcast, you're likely interested in Israel and you probably have hopes to travel here soon. Lucky for you, we've got the scoop on Masa Israel journey. Okay, you guys have to check these people out. MasaIsrael.org. With they have an amazing range of life-changing opportunities in Israel. Masa has so many different programs. They got gap year programs. They have academic programs, internships, volunteering, career programs, and the pandemic didn't stop them either. Promoting options to study remotely while living in Israel. Masa is just giving you the opportunity to change your life. You don't need to be fluent in Hebrew. You don't need to break your bank account. They even supply partial funding. So make a positive impact on the world. Fuel your passion. Make your travel dreams a reality. Go to MasaIsrael.org and find out more. So where do we start? I think just yeah. to understand what makes you not so knowledgeable about climate. Right. That's a great place to start. Um, let's be totally honest. I'm not what um, people would say. I'm not a climate scientist. Mm -hmm. I do not work directly on topics related to the climate or to its effect. Um, I do know a lot about solar panels because I've studied that in industry and in academia. Um, what I do for a living is theoretical physics which means that I look at a system, a real system, say a photosynthetic cell or something like that, and I build a model. A model is a mathematical set of equations or something like that. And then I run it on a computer or I, I solve the problem with my pen and uh, paper. And then I compare. I compare the theory to the experiment. I compare what I got from the model to the data that is provided to me by the experimentalist. And I've gotten pretty good at that, at comparing models and theories to real data. And this is basically the knowledge that I took with me when I started uh, thinking about this problem of uh, climate change and, and energy and the environment and so on. So now, you're not a climate scientist, you're a scientist who is interested and knows a lot about climate, basically. Exactly. That's, that's a great way to put it. And I have to tell you, I came from the dark side. Mm. I mean, if I'm, if I'm thinking six, seven years ago, I was worried about climate change as the next guy. But I was also an expert on, on solar panels. That I was already for uh, quite some time. And when this push towards a renewable energy started you know, being felt 
um, around the world and in Israel, I started thinking, you know, I should go into this because it's interesting. Mm-hmm. And I started diving into the data and, you know, I shifted. Mm-hmm. I shifted my opinions quite completely and um, we'll talk about that. So, yeah, so that's that's really interesting. I think to me, the like, there's it breaks down into two main subjects, climate changes. And one is kind of what's happening, what's going on in the globe, what's happening with the climate. Is Why? it warming? Is it clo- Yeah, is it colding? Why is it happening? How much is humans? How much isn't? What's the effect? And then the other question is, how much should we worry about it and what should we do about it and when? Um, so maybe we'll start with the first. What right. is going on? Right. Um, so the data shows that the, te- the Earth has warmed over the last 100 years for about a degree 0.1 centigrade. That's the number since the 1880s or something like that. Okay, no, no uh, uh, big controversy about that. Is there none? Because I remember a time when people were talking about the models and how well, accurate I, they I, could I, be. I, I, I have to say that um, if I'm allowed to call myself a climate skeptic, or I call myself a climate realist, actually, or a climate rationalist, um, there's no unison of opinions. Mm-hmm. We, there is a consensus. No, no, um, there is a con- there's a party line, but no consensus. We'll talk about the consensus in a second if you want. So a lot of people that I know and talk about uh, also say uh, we disagree with the data about warming because the data that NASA provided like 10 years ago showed no warming at all in the continental US, for example. So um, you need to understand the globe is a big place. And measuring the temperature of the globe is a hard thing. Mm-hmm. So it's a complex problem. But as far as I could uh, uh, understand the data and the, the tweaks that they do to it and the corrections and the measurements and so on, I do think there is a, a warming of about one degree centigrade. That sounds about right. From Which the means in, in like the... The trend is bad, right? Because if, let's say... Oh, wait, wait, you see? Ah. Now we're, we're going to the now second we're part. Getting, we're getting there. So let's start by talking about the science. Okay. Because when you say bad, you're already moving away from science. Mm-hmm. And this is one of the key things that people don't understand, that um, you have measurements. Measurements do not uh, carry any moral load with them. They're just numbers. And then you need to ask yourself, is it good? Is it bad? What does it mean? So mm-hmm. the fact that the temperature is changing, it was going up, is not good nor bad until you think about the meaning of that to human lives. Now, let's before we go into that, let's take a, 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 a minute and realize that although you hear a lot that there's an unprecedented a, a rise in temperatures over the last 100 years, I don't think that's the case. I have read, I'm going to say dozens, probably you know over 60 papers, who discuss something called the medieval warm period, which was about 1,000 years ago, and the globe was as hot as today, if not hotter. And I can show with multiple references that it was a global trend. How can we know that? There was though? actually uh, right. That's a great question. There's actually you sent me the, the the recently the flood that happened in Germany, I think, or in the in somewhere in Europe. There was mm. a flood, and there was this old city that had fl- this old town that had flooded, and they had marked in the years where the flood. And there was a there, the highest mark was from like 1400. Yeah, no, no. There, there's, I, the I, I don't think there's a. Um, so first of all, how do we measure temperatures? We use proxies. So proxies are physical measurements that are correlated with temperature. Roughly. Though. Roughly. And if you can uh, 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 rule out the other uh, uh, ingredients that provide change to that uh, uh, physical measurement, then you can roughly trace the temperature. And there are many, many proxies. And you uh, uh, accumulate all the proxies and you make some kind of uh, average. It's a beautiful, beautiful science. Really, it's, it's wonderful. It's really 
a, a fantastic science, and people who do that are really smart, and chemists and physicists, and they do a great job. And so, they have so they show that in the past, Earth was already warm. Yes, and, and that's probably true for a thousand years ago, and that's probably true for 2,000 years ago, and probably true for 3,000 years ago. Proxy data becomes harder to, to realize as you go back. The resolution becomes... A, they a take weaker. it from minerals and stuff like no, that? No, there are, there are many, many methods, many, many methods. One method is um, digging ice cores. From, from glaciers and measuring the, you know, the size of bubbles and the ratio of isotopes inside them of the gases and the trace of CO2 and uh, oxygen inside the bubbles. It's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, other very famous method, which is pretty lousy, actually, is measuring the width of tree rings. But that's a, a, a not a great way because tree rings are also correlated with nutrition and with soil uh, uh, properties and so on, and various other kinds of measurements. And, and as I said, it's a beautiful science. And that science tells us, um, as far as I can see from the uh, uh, literature, that the Earth has been warm in the last thousand years. What it does not tell us, because it's very hard to measure, is how fast the warming happened. Because we don't have the temporal resolution for that. What we do know is that at the beginning of the 20th century, the first 40 years of the 20th century, um, heating the, the Earth w w was heated at about the same rate it is heated now. Although we did not... You mean uh, the trends the trend, were the, the same? Exactly, exactly. In the or, first 40 years of the 20th century, from yes, 1900 to 1940. Exactly. But we did not emit any CO2. So it was the it was the high the the, the middle peak. of the industrial uh, yeah. revolution? Yes, but this was not even close to the, to the emissions to, in scale. This, the, we started emitting suit on large scales after the economic boom of the uh, after the Second World War. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty clear that the Earth can uh, experience temperature changes without us doing anything. And this has to do with a lot of physical uh, properties of the Earth and its relation to the Sun and the circulation of the two fluids that surround the Earth, which are the oceans and the atmosphere. And it's an extremely complicated system with many, many length scale and many, many oscillations on very different scales. So um, it's a really complicated system. Mm -hmm. And But the, the thing is, anybody who would hear you saying this today like most of the mainstream media, most most people in the mainstream. I mean, I think 90% of the people I work with, 90% of the people we know would hear you saying this, they would call you a climate uh, denier. Right, which is a beautiful phrase, right? Because it already puts me in a place with Holocaust deniers and, yeah. and something like that. It's, re it's really a, a, a label which tells people, don't listen to this guy. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I want people to listen to me. I'm not saying anything that, you know, I'm not inventing Well, any you data. came to the wrong place then. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, uh, of course, the thesis is that the warming uh, over the last 50 years, although it's been very little warming over the past 20 years, by the way, there's been a, a, a really slow down of heating, which was never predicted by the models. So the thesis is that um, it's due to CO2. Mainly, mm -hmm. right? And scientifically, and, it makes sense. CO can't CO2 so, cause yes. that effect? Okay, so CO2 is definitely a greenhouse gas. In a very specific scientific manner, it absorbs a, a infrared radiation. Which is like the heat that's bouncing off right, the Right, that's, that's the heat that's bouncing. We're not going to go into the... A, but a roughly. Roughly. So the, for, the, the, you know, the, like the sun provides us with grade energy. By, right, so grade. the sun provides us yeah. with energy, sunlight, yeah. right? That heats the earth. Now, when uh, uh, something heats up, it radiates out light. It's light that we can't see. It's in the infrared, mm -hmm. but it's as light as the light that's coming in from the sun, right? It's just, uh, uh, we can't see it because the, the wavelength is too long. But molecules which have a uh, uh, triatomic structure, like CO2 or methane or H2O, also known as water vapor, mm -hmm. um, they can absorb this light. So they absorb part, part of it 
and reflect that radiation back to Earth. So you'd expect some heating due to CO2, right? That's not a plausible argument. That's definitely, to some degree, that's probably happening. Mm -hmm. And the question is really quantitative. The question that everyone is, you know, all the, the people, you know, we know this is happening, we know, yes, you know, I'm also know this is happening, you know, CO2 is a greenhouse gas, but what's the ex extent of the effect? How much is it warming? Right, yeah. and the amazing thing is that the answer to that is we don't know. We don't know what's the extent of the effect. And, and that's not me saying, this is the IPCC report. There's a number which is called the equilibrium climate sensitivity. That's roughly the response of the temperature of the earth to doubling of the CO2, right? It's funny, I'm suddenly realizing that for decades we were being primed to to react to uncertainty with worst case scenario, meaning that's what happened, right, in the last two years with COVID. Yeah. There was a yeah. lot of uncertainty, yeah. and the immediate response is we have to stop everything and take the, the strongest measures possible. And, I, and suddenly I'm realizing that's, that existed for decades. It was the, the climate you know, yes, culture. Yes, and that in many ways is a terrible, terrible policy. Yeah. And we'll get there. Because yeah. you pay the price in advance for right. something that might something not happen. something that might not happen. Right. So, yeah. so let, let's just finish the point. The equilibrium climate sensitivity is a number mm -hmm. which is roughly between 1 and 5. The IPCC says it's between 2 and 4.5, and or maybe 1.5 to 4.5. The, the, the different measures. I can show you many, many papers in the literature by really good scientists who uh, uh, state that that number is between 1 and 2. This, for, for this number represents how how much does CO two affect the temperature, ah, okay. right? Okay. If it's below two, we have a long time to prepare for whatever's coming our way. If it's six, we're in shit. But the IPCC cl states quite clearly we don't know what that number is. But more importantly, that our knowledge of that number hasn't changed for fifty years. What's well, the IPCC again? The IPCC is the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change. That's the UN body uh -huh. that is responsible for a gathering everything humanity knows about climate change. That's not completely true. It's a biased body. It's a political body in many, many ways. But if you read the reports, and I've read you know big chunks of the reports, a 3,700 pages report, but I've read big chunks of it. Wow. Yeah, it's terrible. It's <laughs> terrible. A sure way to um, fall asleep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In many chapters it is. Um, there's really good science there. Mm -hmm. And the message that it brings is completely different than what you hear. Mm -hmm. And this leads us to the second uh, part of the claim, right? Because, okay. Let's say that it's six. The number. Well, let's no, say it's no, six. No, let's not say it's six because that's... But if, it were, but if it were six or if it were five? If it were five, then we... Should we have done anything about it? Well, that's a great question. And I've been thinking about that um, for a bit. And the answer is yes. We should... If we would have known that the number is six, which we don't, this is an important point then we should all stop doing what we're doing and start building nuclear power plants. Mm -hmm. And But obviously no one is doing that, so they admit we don't know that. On the, on the contrary, they've been dismantling sure. and perfectly good condition power plants, nuclear plants in Europe for yeah. Yeah, for to decades. amazing stupidity. Yeah. And they're paying the price because they're burning coal right now, like crazy. Yeah, now they owe, owe everything to, to Russia, and <laughs> yeah, it leads yes. to war, basically. Yes. The, uh, that's pretty amazing, the, the geopolitical uh, uh, connection yeah. to energy. And we'll get to energy, but let's first start, finish the climate. Okay. So we agree, you know, the temperature is rising. Now the question is, so what? Now you say climate crisis, right? That's the... The, the 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 global term in Hebrew mashber aklim right now yeah we need oh, to I forgot to even mention that's true that's the next step in the evolution of the name so right global warming climate change climate crisis right now. right, right. I, I've heard climate breakdown <laughs> 
many, 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 catastrophe. many names. Time catastrophe. Yeah. Now, these are not words from the realm of science. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, what is a crisis, right? It's a sudden a, a, a complex problem that we need to overcome, right? So you ask yourself, okay, it's going to be heated maybe by another half degree to the end of the century. Where's the problem, right? And as far as I can see from the data, and I've read, I'm going to say, hundreds of papers and the IPCC report and so on, um, I'm not convinced there is a problem. Now, this might be, that might sound weird because, you know, we're flooded with, with propaganda on, on, you know, climate crisis is everything. You know, the, the Israeli Secretary of Environment has declared herself the global secretary for a reduction yeah. of emissions. She's going to save the planet. Yes. She basically, guys, just stopped uh, the searches for uh, gas. Yes, yes gas. that was her colleague. But they're, they're, they're yeah. both in the same boat in this uh, uh, hilarious stupidity. Yeah. To save the earth, they're stopping the search for gas, which is much greener than coal or, yeah, or oil or whatever. Yeah. And which, which could potentially, I mean, you mentioned it before, has geopolitical effects. I mean, Israel until recently, until discovering the gas, was dependent on other nations yeah. for their energy Since we sources. found gas, now, now when, when Europe is paying amazing prices for gas we pay nothing and uh, yeah it's quite quite amazing how thoughtless and reckless that move was mm-hmm. and we will talk about this okay oh, no no we'll get there we'll get en- <laughs> energy is important we'll get okay. there we're, we're, so i i, I so just you're want, saying you're not convinced uh, and i'm gonna that. say why so you want to quantify what a crisis is Right. Mm-hmm. That's that's the 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 attempt that scientists are doing. They're saying, yeah. okay, okay, what is a crisis? Um, you know, I, my girlfriend left me. I'm in a crisis, right? <laughs> yeah. But that's not uh, quantifiable scientifically. No, a crisis right? is what Greta says is a crisis. Right. That's also my not, definition. To me, least. it's not good enough, right? <laughs> so I go and look at the numbers. So pick a number. Pick a crisis, right? What's the the most you know horrific uh, thing that can happen due to global warming? I would say uh, that the southern hemisphere would be too hot for people to live in, and the entire of Africa would end up in Israel. There's, yeah. <laughs> okay. Wow, that got political quick. Yes, that went <laughs> south really fast. <laughs> <laughs> let's say, uh, let's say. Uh, look, we are the only, people tend to forget, we are the only um, land uh, border yeah. with Africa. Yeah. Um, l- l- let's think globally. Let's think Greta. Okay. Let's think, you know, what yeah, the those... overflow of the oceans. Right, the... right. Overflow of the Mil- oceans. Millions, you know, not even millions. Let's say hundreds of thousands of people dying uh, a year from... Uh, floods. From floods. Right. And, uh, Excellent. And fires. Fires, fires, floods, oceans rising. Come on, yeah. give it to me. Yeah. Hails, um, thunderstorms, tornadoes hurricanes, tornadoes, hurricanes. Let me give you some numbers. Just we're gonna. T- it's gonna take five minutes, and I'm gonna drop you to your knees. I love numbers. Yes, I I do too. That's why I'm a theoretical <laughs> physicist. So, the temp- the the sea rise, right, has been going on since 1880, roughly, uh-huh. in roughly a constant a, a rate. Okay. No big change due to CO2. What's that rate? Now, remember, it's hard to measure, and sometimes the earth is sinking, not the water rising, but let's agree on about three millimeters per year. That's roughly the number that the IPCC quotes. That's three centimeters a decade. That's 30 centimeters over 100 years. For our American listeners... 13 centimeters is like, about what, 12 a foot. inches? A foot? That's about yeah. a foot, yeah. That's the catastrophe? <laughs> I mean, seriously. Yeah, it's like, uh-oh, it's up to my knees. But if there's yeah. a no, trend, it's not, not up to your knees. Up to, it's, halfway it's up a, to my knees. Halfway. But it's, if there's a trend, then it might exponentially grow oh, in the future. Oh, I, I see you've been listening to Corona reports. Yes, I'm yes. taking the COVID why, arguments. Why is and the I word exponential them. even here? Is, there's no evidence for that in the data. So it's constantly the same number every Pretty year. Pretty much. It's, it's been a little bit faster in the last 10 years, but we don't know why. Mm-hmm. Because the, 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 
the glaciers haven't been melting at a higher pace. And, you know, some of that is because places are sinking. It's, it's a complex problem. But what about problem. fires? Fires is a very much stressing right. issue, issue so, in the so past years. So that's, that's a, a great point. Only that if you go to the science and you actually read the papers from the observations of NASA, which are published in Nature and Science and papers like that, you actually see that over the last 30 years, the amount of fires globally went down 25%. Amazing. That's a fact. Why before, is that? The amount that. of fires or area, the amount? Area. Area, area. burnt. Yes, area burnt. Mm -hmm. Now, let's so make... The extent of fires. Yes, the area burnt in the, globally now went down 25%. Now, the reason for that... We got better in fighting them. People yeah. don't like smoke. That's it. Fires are an essential ingredient in the earth system. There have always been fires. Remember that fire two years ago in Australia? Mm -hmm. That's not even remotely the largest fire in Australia. That fire, the largest fire in Australia that is recorded happened in the 70s, and it was 10 times larger. It was in an unpopulated area, so you know, nobody heard about it. Mm -hmm. It was in the 70s. We were worried about global cooling. But there was nothing special about the Australia fires. Now, the California fires, which are indeed increasing, have nothing to do with climate change. It's all due to the uh, Gray Owl Act, to the fact that in California, Oregon, and uh, Washington State, it's becoming harder and harder to uh, um, manipulate uh, woodlands. So what do you mean? It means that when you have a, a, a forest, you need to manage it, mm. right? You need to uh, uh, clean, it. clean it. You need to, to gather uh, Make sure uh, dry people wood. Make sure people buy the law. In the, in the, if they, right. Yeah. Now, because of uh, uh, environmental policies, every time you cut a tree, every time you cut a tree, instead of going through one or 10 signatures, you now need to go through 130. There was a paper about this. I don't remember the numbers. It's become much, much harder. It takes much, much longer. Mm -hmm. So the, the firefighting agencies are doing it way, way slower. But, but what if we take, for example, now there was the whole Canada uh, thing in the headlines where it was really, really cold there. And I saw some numbers. I can't quote them, but that... In Canada, for example, it is getting like colder and colder, and and then like in Israel, the, they measure how not like the one day where the heat was. But yeah, in the Azure, the, yeah. So okay, so uh, first of all, the Earth is getting a bit warmer, so you're gonna see, for example, and colder. Uh, no, warmer. Just warmer. Actually, yes. So all that claim that in places like Canada, it's gonna get, it is getting <laughs> colder and colder. That's far fetched. Well, it, it, we, the climate is an extremely complicated system, as I've said. And it's very, it's essentially impossible to uh, um, <clears throat> relate any one cli a, a, a weather incident mm -hmm. to any global trend to prove on a long-term scale. correlation, essentially. You can't do that. You can't do that. The models are extremely bad. Mm -hmm. They are very, very bad at doing what uh, you just said. So, you know, the weather is a tough thing. Humans have always experienced bad weather, right? We've yeah. always fought that. So, uh, um, there's not much you can do about you know cold days in Canada. It's been it's always been cold in Canada, right? Let's talk for a second about our uh, because you're talking about natural disasters. I, I'm I'm tempted to mention this the trend of deaths from natural disasters but we'll get to that maybe soon because i think that sort of goes into the second category of right. how worried should we be right and, right so so, but, so yeah okay uh, so let me quote a few numbers yeah, from the minutes. ipcc yes. right sorry um the ipcc states the, mm -hmm. the report the last report that came right before the glasgow cop 26 uh, meeting states very clearly and i can give you the page numbers i have it all written down there has been no observation of any trend in the last hundred years. Remember, the temperature went up one degree in floods. No trend in floods. No observed trend. And this is statistics. If you don't observe a trend, there's no trend. No trend in floods. 
no trends in hurricanes, no trends in tornadoes, no trends in uh, winter storms, no trends in severe winds, no trends in hailstorms, no trends in essentially anything. Some this is from the IPCC report yes, I of think 2000, like last 2000, year? Last year, yeah. Okay. yeah. Wow. That's written black and white. Of course, it's not written in the summary for policymakers. Yeah, and or, it's or in the uh, one-pager for CNN. Definitely not written for the, in the one-pager for media. Yeah. But it's written in, this, in the scientific parts. Yeah. And, and the reason is that those parts are actually written by scientists. And they want to be uh, accurate. With right, accurate. Yeah. Right. So that's pretty amazing. That is incredible. I, I want to ask you about uh, Wait, our the, ability. He, he had five minutes of data for us. No, it's just... Well, we've been talking for eight. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wanted to ask you about our ability to predict because that's one of the things that is, is related to the science and is often quoted. I know that there are there's a certain prediction from the 80s. I think that a lot of people like to mention a prediction about where we are today and it's usually cited that it was accurate because a lot of the times the claim is, okay, if we look 50, 100 years forward, how can we know what's going to happen? And the claim is we already have the science to predict it. <laughs> so we don't have the science to predict this. Okay. And now we're talking about... Do you know what I'm talking about, about from yes, the 80s? Yes, yes, yes. What, what is it called? So, okay. Um, it's like let, a let famous me give, prediction. Let me give a, a crash course in computer modeling of climate. Okay. There is no computer modeling of climate. It's a <laughs> terrible problem. It's really tough problem. It's a set of very, very complex nonlinear differential equations, which you put on computer. You grid the computer, you, you grid the earth into bins, which are about 200 kilometers in, in uh, area, 200 kilometers uh, by 200 kilometers or 4,000 kilometers square. Which is crazy because it can be 10 <coughs> degrees here and like 20 definitely, degrees in, definitely. in Haifa. And, and so... And, and there are huge amounts of parameters that go into this because climate is a really complicated system. About 1,000, 1,000, 2,000, between 1,000 and 1,200 parameters that go into these models. Many of them we don't know. So people guess these numbers and that's what's called a realization of a climate model. And there are about 40 or 50 like those in the, earth, in, in, in the world. And they can predict anything. So the span of predictions is so ridiculously broad that you can always say, oh, someone predicted this and that. Because of the error, like because of the, yes, the, the error, range of errors? Right. The range of errors between models is huge. So you can always pick some model that predicted something and say, ah, we got that right. But there, is, there are amazing meteorological uh, uh, characteristics that the models get completely wrong all the time. And there are global features of the climate, which we know about, that the models get wrong. For example? For example, there's something called the ITCZ. It's a, it's a, 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 a strip uh, above uh, north of the equator, which is called the inter, uh, uh, intertropical convergence zone, where hot air from the equator collides with cold air from the uh, uh, poles, whatever, right? And on Earth, there's only one, just north of the equator. And in all the models, there are two. Now, here is where I know something about models. If your model doesn't fit the data, stop everything and check out what's wrong. Now, climate scientists, modelers, they actually do that. They, they publish papers on why the, the ITCZ paradox and, and so on. But... This needs to put a red flag over anyone that tells you, oh, the models predicted something. The models cannot even simulate global climate now. So there is no real uh, truth in them, in, in, in the scientific sense of models versus reality. Let's... I think we are a bit lost in, in, in hardcore okay. discussion. Like, let's go back to, to the basics. So you said temperature is rising. Yeah. It is rising. As far as I can see. Okay. Yeah. So it means that in X years, it will be too hot in certain areas That's of the earth. That's an incorrect statement. How come? Because we don't know what's going to happen in X years. Assuming the... It's like the, the stock market. Assuming that the trend continues, it can happen though, right? 
Yes. Okay. And that can cause harm to humanity. Now, we don't know for sure it's because why this happens. Yes, let's that's say, a correct statement. Let's say 50%, it's just nature doing its thing, and 50%, we have something to do with it, okay? I, I think that's uh, too much, but okay. Let's say let's, for the sake of the right, argument. Okay. And let's say now we, okay, so we want to, we can agree that if it were to happen, right, that the Earth would have gotten warmer, uh, it would be bad. For humanity this is um already uh, something you need to convince me with because people around the earth the world die a lot more from cold weather than from hot weather mm -hmm. about five times more in the developed the be developed countries and about 15 to 20 times more in third world countries like india like africa like south america which are not pretty which are not very cold places, but they have cold spells, and people die from those. And there is no data that shows that winters are getting colder. No, no. Actually, winters are supposed to get a bit warmer. Mm -hmm. So the whole climate change, instead of global warming, is, is false, right? Well, According you know, to climate that. is always changing. No, but they say, like, don't say, don't say global warming, because it's not only warming, it's also getting colder in winters. That's, that's just untrue. As far as I understand the data, yes, that's untrue. Okay. So you say it's not bad for humanity that Earth gets... A if, little warmer, for a little, sure. But, but if for it gets sure. much warmer in well, 100 years. So... Uh, could what, this be bad, potentially? Can we agree that could be bad? Yes, if it gets five degrees warmer, sure. <laughs> why, it, why are you laughing? Yes, we're going to go... <laughs> it, it could get bad. Yeah. It could get bad, yes. Okay. Right. If it was double so, the temperature, it would be very bad. Right. Yes. But... The odds for that are so small mm -hmm. that there's nothing we can do about that. And and the the example that Bjorn Lomborg gives, I don't know if you've heard about them. He's uh, an economist and a political scientist, and he's um, he runs a think tank, you know, who's trying to 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 prioritize problems around the globe. And he's saying worrying about the tail of uh, global warming is like worrying about an asteroid. Now, asteroids are a big problem. You know, if, if, if a, a rock, you know, a kilometer wide hits the Earth, we're gone. Mm -hmm. That's a big problem. Unless, of course, uh, we send a mission to Yeah, them. okay. <laughs> now, it's funny that you mention it because there's a new Netflix oh, movie that. called was... Don't Look Up, which is obviously a critique on on global on climate change it's it's a i i didn't like the movie i know not no not because of its critique it's just not interesting enough yeah it wasn't that good but it yeah. was obviously a critique it's about these two journalists who discover an asteroid no, that's two, plummet, scientists. two scientists who yeah. discover this asteroid that's plummeting towards earth and they're going around on this media uh uh this media uh tour trying to convince people to give a shit about it which is obviously, you know, yeah. oh, scientists are... And so the way they see it, I think... I mean, this is Leonardo DiCaprio has obviously like been activate, <laughs> activi like an activist for climate change for a long time. Yeah. The way they see it is an asteroid coming to Earth. Right, but that's totally a totally wrong analogy. Now, let me tell you something. Asteroids are coming to, towards Earth. They're doing that all the time. And the U.S. is monitoring 90% of them. Mm -hmm. Why aren't the U.S. monitoring 99% of them? And the, and the answer is that going from 90% to 99%... Costs double. No, double. Triple. Ten times more. Mm. Ten times more. Okay. And risk management. Basically. And it's a risk management problem, mm -hmm. right? And the American people say, we don't care about that kind of risk. But mm. you said that CO2 does affect... To some extent, for sure. And... And then you say that the Earth is getting warmer. So why isn't it so, why is it so far fetched to connect between the two? Well, two because facts. because we need scientific evidence in order to connect two variables which are changing at the same time. Correlation is not causation. Because there are there, if the, I understand correctly, there are other greenhouse gases like water vapor and uh, methane, uh, and we have no uh, idea. Because there are other things controlling the changes of temperature throughout uh, yeah. the evolution of the climate. Mm -hmm. And we don't know... Other man-made things, though? Such uh, as, as... Oh, for as sure, potent, for as, sure, for sure. As in dominant. The, as sure. In the cities, it's much warmer than outdoors, mm -hmm. right? Because of the urban island effect, of course. When we change, when we cut down trees in Europe and, and made it grassland to grow crops, 
sure, we changed the climate. Of course, we've been doing that for a long time. It's and a when slow we grow meat for, for food and the, the, the animals. Yeah. Everything the humans farts. do yeah. <laughs> affects <laughs> the environment. That's the <laughs> scientific term you were looking for, cow farts. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, okay, so I think we've established that, I mean, from your point of view, we don't want to, you know, we don't want to get canceled on Spotify or anything. Yeah. So we're throwing <laughs> you under the bus. Yeah. Fine. So, uh, <laughs> if, from your if, point of view. If, if I'm allowed I'm to, to summarize. Yeah, yeah, So yeah. if you summarize it in two sentences pretty fast, the, um, the statement that CO2, man-made CO2 is responsible for uh, the, the warming is a thesis, mm-hmm. which is yet to be proven or disproven. That's it. Okay. That's the level of things. And in terms of, of crisis, yeah. I am not convinced. I'm not convinced the, uh, uh, the world is at the best place it's been. Humanity is at its best, you know, forever. Yeah. Uh, deaths due to meteorological extreme events have gone down 99%. Yeah. And this leads us to the third part, right? How did we do that? How did we manage to take something as dangerous as weather and make it not dangerous? And the answer, and I've been thinking about this a lot and I've been listening to to many people, the answer is power. Power is energy per unit time. And that's what allows us to free ourselves from hard labor. That's it. Explain. Elaborate. Right. 300 years ago, about 95% of humanity were, were farmers. As a farmer, what you do, you wake up in the morning and you go work. And the, the, the uh, labor comes from the body of the human being, mm-hmm. which is not a very efficient machine. So you can only do so much. And then something amazing happened. Slowly by slowly, I mean, the, 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 by the way, the, the Industrial Revolution was not instantaneous. It took a while, it took 100 years. But a little by little, people started realizing that you can actually gain much more power, that's energy per unit time, mm-hmm. by burning coal. And then... Like you start from one horse equals one horsepower. Right, exactly. And then you build an engine. Mm-hmm. And an engine operates at horsepowers. This is exactly where that phrase is coming from. This is a measurement... Horsepower is a measurement of, of power, yeah. of energy per time. Now, energy is the ability to generate change. That's the scientific, physical definition of energy, is the ability of something to generate change. And this is what people have been doing since forever to live. We've generated change. There's nothing natural about crops in England. Mm -hmm. There's nothing natural about uh, uh, solar panels. There's nothing natural about anything that we do. We are constantly changing an environment in order to make our lives better. And the more power you have, the more change you can do And then two things happen. First of all, the change becomes larger per unit time. So you can grow more crops or you can build more roads and you can build fortified houses which will not break down in a storm or you can heat your homes and you will not die if you have a a four-day cold spell in Canada. Mm -hmm. Right? That's one thing. But then the earth explodes from people. Rega, we'll get there. (laughs) That's that's a a different issue. Para, para, we say in Hebrew. Um, the other thing that it does, it frees people's time mm-hmm. because a machine is doing the labor and now you can send your kids to school and now you can spend time thinking, right? That's what I do, right? I spend my days basically thinking. And people pay for that. And people pay me for that. That's ridiculous. You, that's ridiculous, right? But this is the amazing gift that power has given us. It's, power is everything. Power is life. Power is the currency we pay nature. Power, to, you mean energy. Power, energy per unit time. Yeah. Energy is not enough. Mm. Energy per, you need to, to, to get the energy out and use it somehow. 
Mm-hmm. So power is the key. And it's everything. It's the water that we drink. It's the food that we eat. It's the uh, pharmaceuticals that we consume. It's the health uh, care that we have. It's the education that we have. It's industry. It's industries. It's the economic growth. Economic growth cannot happen without power. Yeah. And this is a given. How many of those climate activists are willing to give up their iPhones? How many of them are willing to uh, uh, give up flying to vacations? Yeah, or to summits about climate. Yes, yes. But, but okay, so, I see what you're saying. So what's, what's the so punch? The punch is, no, it, that we need first to realize that we cannot do as humanity without power. I think we first need to realize to, to broaden on your point is that we are starting from a very good point, right? Like, like present is great. So we need to be careful not to, to, to make it worse with good intentions, make it worse just because of reasons that make no sense, basically. Right? On the spot. That's perfectly correct. Yeah. When one of the things that, so, but let's say, Let's say carbon emissions, we can, we can agree that carbon emissions and fossil fuels and, and all of this stuff that we're using to generate most of the power on Earth today and that we've used to reach the place that we are is bad, which also I think is an assumption because like you mentioned, maybe, maybe, by, maybe by warming the planet, we're, we're actually avoiding an ice age. Like we don't actually or know. Saving but, dolphins. But or saving dolphins. <laughs> I don't <laughs> understand how that <laughs> maybe Me neither, but maybe. maybe. Right? The, one of the Who things in social like sciences is unintended consequences, right? right? So right. maybe we're saving dolphins. Uh but what I'm saying is let's say it's bad. No, I don't I don't agree with I I don't agree with this premise. No, I'm saying let's let's just as a premise okay. say that it's that they're not optimal. Okay. I think they're bad not optimal. consequences of yeah. that are a bit more yeah, than the good. That they're not optimal. That maybe we there's another so and as I understand it, there is another source. Yes. And which, here here we get to your actual official specialty. Well right? uh, um um you, uh, I've been thinking a lot about this. I mean solar panels are my my yeah. yes I've written papers about solar panels and, and, and solar and panels can, aren't necessarily a viable alternative they're necessarily not yeah. a viable alternative they never will be they never will be and why then, because um solar panels if you need to characterize solar panels and actually wind turbines are characterized by two physical uh, uh, characteristics the first is Is an extremely low power density density is per unit uh, area now um, hydrocarbons fossil fuels are amazingly dense in energy amazingly dense you take a gallon and you can drive from here to Haifa yeah mm-hmm. they're amazing and uh, sorry just a, th- a random thought they're 3d yes exactly right? exactly power plants grow in 3d yeah and and, and, and solar panels are 2d Also wind turbines. They're oh, essentially yeah. two-dimensional. So you need amazing uh, quantities of area, land use. Now, uh, uh, that's one thing. The second thing is that the lower the energy density, the higher the material need. You need a lot of stuff in order to generate this energy. You need concrete to make these uh, wind towers. You need silicon. You need a uh, whole bunch of materials. You need rare earth materials. You're going to need lithium by the gazillions in order to generate enough storage. We'll get there. And, uh, you know, if something is low on power density, it's material intensive. And the source itself is also intermittent and weak. That's and the weak, second characteristic. Right? And unreliable. Right. That um, what people call green energy, Uh, energy sources should really be called unreliable sources because we need power all the time all the time yeah but the wind only blows when it's blowing and the uh, sun never shines at night nowhere on earth yeah, you I don't want to get to the hospital and they can be like <laughs> we can't treat you today it's there's not for the wind. North Pole yeah Uh, yes, but then you have six months of, 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 of yeah, that's uh, also true. <laughs> there's a problem. Yeah. So 
This intermittency is not something that we can solve with a current technology but maybe storage will get it gets better it gotten better in the past it has not gotten better in that's 50 a, years it that's did. an amazing uh, uh, mistake that people do it has not gotten better batteries now look pretty much the same that they did 50 years ago look at like a tesla like the entire bed of the car is just a bunch of batteries yes tesla yes couldn't have been made 50 years ago. that's incorrect it could have been made yes i mean sure there have been engineering uh, uh, advances and, and and auto advances but the battery battery itself it's just a lithium-ion battery you know they, they've been doing this wrong of course they keep doing it better and better but not by a margin let me give you some numbers because this is important the what was till uh, three years ago the biggest uh, a battery plant on earth built by Tesla in southern Australia has the capacity of storing energy and these are the official numbers, for 30,000 Australian households for an hour and a half. <laughs> I also have an anecdote. Uh, uh, now, now yeah. uh, um, the next one, the next biggest, which is now built in California, of course, uh, can provide uh, the numbers, I don't remember offhand, about twice as that. Wait, so let, let's get, the, I just want to get this straight. The biggest factory can produce, can supply power for 30,000 households for an hour and a half but what does that mean the factory because the factory is producing batteries so the um, the battery no 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 the factory is producing power the the, the it, it, it's a battery farm ah it's a battery farm yes yes so it, there's just a bunch of batteries that are being powered by solar or whatever yes and then they're by, powering by homes. diesel generators actually but never mind that okay so whatever the batteries <laughs> yeah. stole a certain store a certain amount of energy and if you just take the amount of energy that's in those batteries and power homes, it's an hour right. and a half for 30,000 now, homes. Now, if you look at the calculations that have been done by the Israeli Authority of Electricity yeah. for the uh, amazing plan by the previous energy minister who, who you know, uh, suggested we go 30% renewable by 2030, that would require... Filling the Negev with... <laughs> yes, 20 power plants like that. <laughs> Tw that that's for thirty. By the way, thirty percent renewable. Twenty power plants, like like the largest one. I don't know if you know Eitan, but in Israel, I don't know. You must know this, uh, but I think it's mind blowing. Do you know how they um, store power in Israel? No. So basically, in Israel today, maybe a bit less, but some time ago, electricity could get expensive, but at night. Uh, uh, or vice versa. Some times of the day it's expensive. Other p times it's it's less expensive for the state for the to to manufacture. So what they came up with? Let's store. Let's produce electricity when it's there's low demand. Store it and then reuse it when there's high demand, and then we can save some money, right? Uh, uh, yes. No. And so how did they do that? Th this is mind blowing. They built. Um, <laughs> So they took a mountain in in the north, and they dug a huge structure, which basically what it does uh, when the power is cheap, it 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 shoves water uphill. Okay, there's a tank of water. It shoves it uphill, and then when there's low demand, high demand, water the water goes down. Hydroelectric. Yeah, wow. and this is a battery. Now they actually right? have, now it's it, just a it's a battery in Israel. We actually have two <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, uh, water storage plants. That's actually the most common. We call them battery mountains. <laughs> battery mountains, <laughs> water storage pump. It's called pumped uh, uh, this is storage. Mind blowing. Yeah, that yes, is that's it's pretty cool technology, yeah, right? Cool. Pumping water up and down. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. Now, two things about that. Clearly, it's not up to scale. Mm -hmm. the 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 amount of of power that can be stored uh, uh, with Israel's um, power mountains. power mountain <laughs> is about five percent of our needs for six hours. That's roughly. It's better than Australia. It's but... <laughs> much better than Australia, but but it costs about three to four times more. Mm -hmm. ah. So the per uh, kilowatt hour it costs about three to four times more. However. This is not a, 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 an unsmart thing to do. And here's the reason why. Because we cannot afford power outages. Mm -hmm. That's something the Western world cannot live with anymore. The country has right? to have a backup generator. Right. 
So, and, and this means that at any point during the day, a, a demand and supply must meet to an amazingly accurate degree. That means that the grid, the electric grid, is an amazingly complicated machine. As we saw in Texas. It, yes, it oh, can get, we can talk about yeah. Texas a lot. So uh, um, uh, the power company, the Israeli power company, um, has a margin of, of spare power, mm-hmm. which is available um, on, demand. on demand if they made an error in estimating the demand for the next five minutes or 10 minutes or half an hour. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because the curves of, of demand and, and supply go really together quite amazingly in the grid, yeah. right? So, so we, we just have a little bit of time left, so oh, I do want us to oof. get to uh, the actual alternative source that yes. m- m- is reliable. Yes. Slaves Nuclear running in... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Nuclear power, of course. This is an amazing, amazing story. We have a form of energy, a, a, a fuel, which is 10 million times denser than coal. 10 million times on every 10 million barrels of Crazy. coal. It's like we could be living in the future. One, one <laughs> barrel of uranium. The entire waste product of the entire uh, US fits in one football stadium. That's it. We know it can be scaled up because the US produces 20% of its power with nuclear power. France uses... 70%, North Korea, South Korea, sorry, 50%. Places like... France is, is using today 70%? More than 70% of its, of its power? Power from comes nuclear? from nuclear. Yes, really? I didn't know that. And it's selling nuclear power to the Germans, which shut off their plants. Guys, if you don't know, by the way, an anecdote, France built uh, our alleged, uh, according to... Uh, yeah. According to our, our alleged <laughs> plant, yeah, our alleged <laughs> plant, France, they they're good. They have history. I will that. not confirm nor deny. Yeah, <laughs> it's a peaceful plant, though. Yeah, uh, huge economies, huge huge amounts of of nuclear power. Mm-hmm. It's scalable. It's a power plant. We're not dependent on nature. We don't need to pray for the gods of wind. But one Hamas missile and... No, that's incorrect. We'll get there. We'll get there. <laughs> but Chernobyl and but Fukushima Chernobyl, yeah, 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 yeah. Three Mile uh, We're gonna get there. We're gonna get there. So, we know it's scalable. We know it's uh, reliable. We actually know it's pretty, it can be pretty cheap. See the, the, the electricity prices in, in France. They're pretty cheap and they are constant. They're not a, a, a whizzing around and we know it's the safest form of energy that we have because when you measure safety of energy you need to measure the safety of power so you measure how many people died per kilowatt hour produced yeah how many people died building like the hoover dam like uh, Hundreds. How many people died falling off a, a solar panel constructions in the U.S. in the last 10 years? Oh, Over man. 25. What? Yes, that's more than the, all the people died from nuclear accidents in the entire history of nuclear, of, of the U.S. nuclear. No, but you can't, I mean, ah, the U.S. nuclear yeah. industry. Yes. Not including okay. Chernobyl. So, oh, uh, let me talk about Chernobyl. First of all. First of all, watch the TV show. It's really nice. It's really nice. It's really good. It's really good. Yeah. It's amazing. Although I saw a YouTube video deconstructing it and Doesn't showing matter. many it's, it's inaccuracies. It's a TV show. Yeah. It's a TV show. It's really nice. Yeah. It's not 100% Chernobyl accurate. was a terrible accident. Yeah. So let me tell you two things about this. First of all, there are no power plants like Chernobyl anymore. Mm-hmm. There are just no plants like that. No one is going to build a power plant like that. Yeah. The power plants are now are, are, are State infinitely of the art. safer. Yeah. Infinitely more safe. Now, how many people died in Chernobyl? Th- we don't know. We do. We do. Mm-hmm. We have a pretty good estimate, including... Directly? Di- and immediately? Well, directly and immediately, the number is 53. Okay. According Inclu- to Russia, it's the number. It's no, the no, 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 no. So, including to, the, l- let's agree that the World Health Organization is mm. uh, gives us a reasonable mm. number. Well, maybe the the total number, including <laughs> okay, let's go cancer, with yeah. whatever, between two thousand and ten thousand people. Now, that's a big number, right? Mm-hmm. It's not near to be uh, a global disaster. Look, in nineteen seventy four, a dam broke down 
on on the Yangtze River in yeah. Banshao. Two hundred thousand Chinese were dead within two days, drowned in their homes. Have That's you heard crazy. about that? No, because no. it's China. Uh, <laughs> well, in, in people in, are like, there's a billion in of them. India. Uh, uh, a plant factory of Dow Chemicals blew up, killing eight thousand people instantly. Have you heard about that? No, because you know, it's third world, and that's what's like that. That's a, right. That's uh, what's that's the point, like, right? It's 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 a tragedy. I it's mean, a it's tragedy. obviously two thousand two hundred thousand people is a tragedy, but I don't think that most climate activists really think about. You no, know, so so let's Chernobyl talk about Chernobyl's much home closer to home. Right, but but then climate they talk about activists. Fukushima. Let's talk yeah. about for a second. How many people died from the Fukushima nuclear like accident? One, right? No, not even one. Zero. Zero? Zero people died from radiation in the Fukushima accident. Now, the Fukushima accident was actually, if you're thinking about it from an engineering point of view, an amazing proof to the stability and safety of nuclear power. Because you took an active power plant, third generation, it was a pretty old plant. It was built in the 70s. Mm -hmm. Right, it's not very good. It was there were many engineering flaws in that power plant, and you experienced the worst case scenario: the sea flooding the earth, wrecking havoc throughout the country. Twenty thousand people dying from the tsunami, and zero people dying from nuclear radiation. So how is this a nuclear disaster? It's not a disaster when no one dies. So, it, it, so this why, is, but, why but, are we? Yeah, no, but I don't understand. Like, can't this be like a? It's it seems to me like the best. Even if if you're a, a um, an environmental activist and a climate denier, isn't it the one point we can all agree upon? So that's actually a correct statement. That that. If you were a true uh, um, um, environmentalist, you would be a great proponent of nuclear power. Maybe that's why no one wants it, because it ends the argument. It's so right. fun to argue. Right. Yeah, so I, I, many I, I, people no, won't so have by careers. By the way, you yeah. actually see in the US and Europe uh, groups coming up which actually uh, uh, promote nuclear power And, and they're worried about the climate. And they say, okay, if, worried, if that's the, a catastrophe, then build power plants. Why are you building something that doesn't work? And, and, and it doesn't work. I mean, we see here in, in Europe what's going on now. They're burning coal like crazy because there was no wind. I, I was just, right after the summit, I was strolling in the villages of, of Italy, and I thought to myself, I mean, oh my God, because when you stroll in the village... You just smell of the pollution and you're thinking like all villages in Europe are use are heating up with non-renewable sources with wood they love their kamins right their their fireplaces no. their their fire in their home they're just which is by the way I think one of the like leading causes of uh, the P Jordan Peterson mentioned this on the podcast we were discussing that one of the leading causes of children dying is uh, that's in the yeah, you get cancer world. from that yeah, from them, that shit them warming yeah. warming their homes with like wood and coal and so yeah. it pollutes the inside of the home also the outside or well, yeah. even if you stroll you smell we love it's so romantic you smell the right the burnt wood but it kills you yeah. the, the thing is that climate values are not the same as environmental values. We would all love to have a great environment, right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's a given. In, in, but climate values, which, you know, thou shall not emit CO2, right? That's the mm -hmm. gospel of Greta. That's opposing environmental values. And that's pretty clear because there's a huge correlation, which is very well understood, between poverty and uh, pollution and environmental problems. Where are the worst places to be, right? It's in Africa, Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, uh, the poorer parts of, of South America. What's the best, cleanest, most environmental friendly places you've been to? Canada, Sweden, Swiss, right? These are the highest power per capita using states in the world. Right? And they're also the cleanest. Mm -hmm. There's a direct link between using power 
and caring about the environment. Because when you use power, you can move out of poverty and uh, care about the environment. Because if you need to care about what your kids are going to eat for dinner, yeah. honestly, fuck the environment. I don't yeah. care if the streets are, are filled with feces or, or, or garbage. I don't care if there's smoke. I need to cook, right? Now, power is key yeah. to... to uh, um, to to, uh, in, to 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 increasing welfare, yeah, for mobility, income mobility, and here comes the amazing hypocrisy of the uh, white, healthy, wealthy uh, West. first world West, because the one agreement that they could sign in COP twenty six, because no agreement was was uh, reached, but they did sign one agreement, twenty six countries including Norway and Belgium and, and, and Switzerland and places like that, uh, uh, signed a pledge that they will not invest in infrastructure from fossil fuels in Africa. And of course, the leading banks, the uh, European Environmental Bank and the uh, World Monetary Fund, they all joined the party. That's amazing because... What You're basically oppressing the third world Africa to enjoy to the same live, perks. to continue living in poverty. That's exactly what it means. Now China and India, they have the capital, mm -hmm. and they're building power plants like crazy from all kinds. But the the uh, countries in Africa, they don't have the capital. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're sitting, you know, Nigeria and and Ghana, and Pacific, they're sitting on huge uh, natural gas fields. And they can't pump it out. Gas they can't is use. better. Oh, just for the... oh, by far, by far, it's it's. Mm -hmm. you the know, density is like much stronger. Than... It's it's cleaner. It doesn't have other stuff, mm -hmm. so it's much cleaner to burn. So it emits way less uh, CO two, for example, about forty percent, and and it emits about ten percent uh, of of pollutants, real pollutants, particles, mm -hmm. and and, and uh, socks and knocks and things like that. Mm -hmm. It's it's an amazingly clean uh, energy source, and it's very very dense. And you just need a power plant to use that. And the Europeans are saying we're not gonna lend you money. Not it's not that the Europeans they're gonna we're gonna ban companies from lending money to that. We should do that. We should. Uh, <laughs> it's like Chuva in, should. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, a, that's not what a bad the, idea. That's what the Chinese are doing. Yeah, the Chinese are doing it. Are investing yes. in Africa. Oh, yes, because they're smart. Yeah. Ah. Le leaving money on the table is definitely not the way to go. So I want to one question before we end, and we'll keep it short because we're already over time and Nora's giving me No, looks. no, no. I'm, I could but, go on uh, and on. But um, what I want to ask you because what you're, the position you're taking is, as we mentioned before, like sort of politically unacceptable. It's faux pas in today's world is yeah. in any western society i feel like it's not acceptable i mean you're you're part of the fringe once you say that not necessarily scientifically but culturally uh and socially are you not afraid for your men and i think many have suffered consequences for things like this are you not afraid does ben gulion give you the the atmosphere to be to speak freely on this are you not afraid about suffering certain consequences if you were in America, you like. Luckily, you're in Israel, I'm right? I'm thinking how to answer that. Okay. So first of all, um, gladly Israel is, as far as I can tell, way more liberal than current state of affairs in the U.S. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. So Israelis are generally, you know, they're they're agreeable to argument. Yeah. Right. This is Which an old they're, tradition. They're disagreeable. Yeah. Right. <laughs> they, 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 that's fine. Um, now I have to tell you, from a personal level, the amount of support that I that I get, both in and out of academia, is quite impressive. A lot of people agree with what I say. A lot don't, and we have fierce arguments, and that's fine. But a lot of people uh, um, tell me. Great job. Go on. We don't want to talk about it, but you know, you're right. We know you're right. A lot. Also in academia. I would rather not comment on what the university is saying about that. 
if that's okay. Okay. That's, that's <laughs> comment enough. Uh, <laughs> Because I, I have to say that, you know, we have tried to bring on, uh, we actually w- first, I think, tried to bring on climate sci- climate scientists, climate experts, and many times have struggled to do not so. Many, but, yeah, it, but yeah. It's, it's not easy so to let, get people. Let, once we tell them, like, you know, we tell people, yeah, we're f- coming from, like, the right-wing angle, people are afraid to come. Uh, okay, L- uh, two things I want to say about that. First of all, I have no understanding why this is a right left conservative angle. It's a scientific question, right? You didn't ask me how I feel about welfare policies. But COVID also or, a scientific about, question, right? But it, it got poli- everything's political. Right, everything. But but uh, as I said, you don't know how I feel about welfare uh, in uh, you got another payments. Hour? <laughs> no, or oh, what I feel about you know yeah. the Israeli-Palestinian uh, uh, conflict or whatever. It has nothing to do with that. But it does. But it doesn't. It does because oh, it's... Oh, this is where it does. Yeah. I constantly invite opponents to come debate me. And I'm constantly refused. Mm-hmm. And more so, I've been interviewed uh, to Arutz Arbaisri, Channel 14. Mm-hmm. And this is the Israeli Fox News or something like that. Um, and they invited the chair of Israel Greenpeace. And they told him, you're not going to have a debate. You're just, you, we're going to interview you. And we're also, you know, uh, 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 interviewing Professor Duby. And he says, oh, he's coming? Then I'm not going to be part of your show. Mm-hmm. So there, there's definitely an attempt of silencing and uh, uh, ignoring. Delegitimizing. Delegitimizing, ignoring, canceling. Which is a tactic that's often used on the left. And it's a good tactic. It's a good tactic. Let's say, okay, I, I'm not. This guy doesn't exist for me. That's a. It's a smart tactic, but it's not gonna work because the public is smarter than that. Yeah, but at it's least n- in it's Israel. not really a good tactic. I think in the I art of war to ignore your enemy. No, no, it's it's you definitely I mean? it's definitely not. That, that's why I'm inviting. Yeah. Uh, well, enemy is a, is a is a is a strong word. I mean, no one's my enemy. We all want you know Israel to thrive and the world. I don't know. Those people could could drive us to to. Well, but they're doing it out decay. of good intentions, I believe. I think even. <laughs> Fine. Oh. Then, then, and then there's the political argument, and 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 of course, climate catastrophism and climate panic leads to a, a lousy, dangerous policies. political decision policies, yeah. like the idea of of not searching for gas. Mm-hmm. And and what wh- what was the the argument there? We're not going to search for gas, so we can a, a concentrate put, concentrate on on solar power. What's the connection between these two? Yeah, yeah. It's ridiculous. And and we're not basically we're not going to focus on on natural gas so we can waste all of your money. No, and all it's not it. even the government. <laughs> the government is not searching for gas. We're going to burn your money. Yeah, it's for private fuel. endeavors. It's private endeavors. They're just giving the licenses for the private endeavors. It's very little work. But they're not doing their job. It's virtue signaling. No. It's it's virtue signaling on the global scale. That's no, but it is burning our money in the sense that oh, when yeah. natural oh, gas yeah. is found, oh, yeah. it cheapens our energy, making us wealthier. Meaning, if I don't oh, have yeah. to pay as much for energy, I'm that much richer. But they're going to make it so much more expensive for me to pay for for energy by not continuing. They're the search. already doing that. So they're burning my money. Essentially, they're already doing that. Israeli uh, citizens are paying at least. At least a mil, a billion and a half shekels every year, direct subsidies for a, a private solar panel uh, owners and 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 solar power producers. Now this is money that's going directly from the poor to the rich. Yeah, at least we can get some consolation in the fact that some of them are falling off their roofs and dying. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> that's awful. Uh, <laughs> That wow. was terrible. That yeah, was, that was just was, awful. Was, but we, we, we. <laughs> That's okay. <here. laughs> yeah. We, no, I'm of course being facetious. I don't want anybody to die. Um, 
we would love to have and you know no or mentioned this also jokingly at the beginning of the episode before we started recording uh that you know it's so nice and warm in the echo chamber we don't want to be in an echo chamber and that was kind of why i mentioned it so hopefully we'll talk to professor doobie after the episode maybe he can link us up with someone that'll or come you on you guys if you or listen if you know this someone, far yeah. please and you know someone who's an expert and lives in israel and yeah send yeah. him our way we definitely want to get the other side and you know hear as much as many points of views as possible but this was very very enlightening yeah. very interesting so much fun thank you so much for coming where, where can people reach out uh, follow you on social media well i'm active ish on facebook okay until you get the platform until i get the platform <laughs> but they can google me mm-hmm. and see my youtube lectures and they can google me and find my email very very easily and just send me questions i'm always happy to answer Amazing. Very Thank cool. You so Thank much. you so much for coming. Before we go, this podcast is made in collaboration. First of all, we're sponsored by Massa Israel. So check yes. them out. Go to MassaIsrael.org. Highly recommended. Um, and then. Yes, we are. Uh, this podcast is made in collaboration with uh, Arut Sheva. Yes. Check them out at IsraelNationalNews.com. Yes. Um, you know, for great content in English coming from Israel, IsraelNationalNews.com. And also AJN.TimesOfIsrael.com, the Australian Jewish News. Yes. Um, if you, if, yeah, if you live in Australia and you have power in your home thanks to the huge battery factories, <laughs> then you can check out uh, AJN.TimesOfIsrael.com for this training angle. And of course... Angle. We do this on our free time, so if you want to help us out, uh, 2NJB.com slash donate. And you can get yourself a 2NJB mug, like a two nice, uh, sorry, a nice Jewish boy mug or a BDS Tears mug, which is my favorite. Just gave it to my dad. He loves it. He sent me a picture this morning. With <laughs> you didn't send coffee. me the picture. I know. I got to show it to you. Uh, get a BDS <laughs> Tears mug or a nice Jewish boy yeah. mug on 2NJB.com slash merch. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Bye, guys. Bye.